Brent Venables did something in year one on the recruiting trail that Lincoln Riley can't touch per Joel Clatt. We'll talk about that on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners. Today's episode of Locked On Sooners is brought to you by LinkedIn. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your 2023 goals. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. Terms and conditions apply. Thank you for joining us. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. My buddy here is Josh Helmer. You can follow him on Twitter at Josh on Ref. You can also hear him Monday through Friday on 94.7 The Ref in Norman. And you can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On Sooners. Don't forget about our live show Monday night, 9 p.m. Central Time. We'll be here to talk all things Oklahoma Sooners, basketball, recruiting, 2023 outlook for the Oklahoma Sooners. But Josh, man, how's your weekend been? How you doing? It was a good weekend, my friend. How was yours? Not too shabby, not too shabby at all. Finally got the little bit of sunshine, so the ice melted away a little bit, and the kids got to get outside. So it's been good. Uh, good for the Oklahoma Sooners. They've had a really nice uh, start to the 2024 cycle, 2025 as well. We'll talk about that on the wide receiver front in the second segment. But looking back to the 2023 se- uh recruiting class joe clatt of fox sports and the joel clatt show had some really positive things to say about oklahoma's 2023 recruiting class oklahoma i thought oklahoma had a really great class and and obviously the the rankings suggest that as far as the total class um, in terms of recruits and transfers number six uh their best since 2021 when caleb williams came in uh they had the the number four class in the country when it just looks at high school recruits that's their best high school class since 2005 so like brent venables did a great job i looked back at some of these classes that they had had high school only over the last few years and lincoln riley wasn't touching that you know 2019 i believe they had like the sixth best class in the country um they had an an eight in there, but then like 10, 13, nine, 19 in 2016. So Brent Venables has done a really good job. Their first class is the best they've had in a long time. Uh, Six of their best seven recruits are either defensive players or offensive linemen. How do you get good? How do you win going into the SEC? You better play good defense. You better play good on the line of scrimmage. And their best player overall is their quarterback that they got, Jackson Arnold. So I loved what uh, Oklahoma did. I loved what Oklahoma did. It was a fantastic recruiting class for the Oklahoma Sooners in 2023. I think the thing that stands out the most is when you look ahead to the SEC, and I think he's absolutely right, being able to hit on defensive players and in your you know offensive and defensive line, in your top seven recruits. That's huge. Uh, We've talked about it on the show, you know, 10 blue chip recruits or signees now at this point of your top 10, sorry, 10 on the defensive side of the football for the Oklahoma Sooners, 10 blue chip players on the defensive side. That's huge for them. Yeah, no doubt. And I mean, a couple of five-star guys in PJ Adebare and Peyton Bowen, but uh, just the depth, the, the depth of blue chip talent that they brought in defensively up front linebackers in the secondary. I mean, the secondary class, we've talked so much about that, John. I mean, it is just littered with talent, not just, not just Peyton Bowen beyond Peyton Bowen, uh, all sorts of names in the secondary for Oklahoma. So, you know, Joel Clatt and some guys that, you know, maybe just like flip over casually to 24 seven sports or on three arrivals. Okay. What do the team rankings look like? And they do it maybe, early signing period, John, and then national signing day. It's, whoa, okay, Oklahoma's got a a great class. And, well, then you do a little deep diving. You say, okay, Oklahoma's really 
really got a great class because lo and behold, this is a class unlike anything that I'm seeing as I just click that little toggle down menu. Okay, well, this is the 23 signing class, and uh, that's number three in the composite. Okay, 2022, oh, eighth, so it's it's not as good. 2021, okay, the uh, 10th, so a little bit further down. And we can do this exercise all the way back for a long, long time, as Joel Klatt pointed out. So it is different the signing class that Oklahoma brought in. And, uh, you know, that's the the big, big reason for optimism. And as I've told you, I don't know how many times, John, the most exciting part for me is that, yes, you've got all that depth defensively in signees, but I feel like it's it's split pretty well for Oklahoma offensive talent, defensive talent, which, guess what? The teams that are winning national championships, they're not heavy on one side of the football. So when Joel Clapp makes the – and I don't, I don't think that he was trying to – I don't think that he was trying to get sideways with Lincoln Riley. I think he's just pointing out Lincoln Riley in his time at Oklahoma, even as great as a recruiting class here or there was, it it wasn't what Brent Venables brought in in this first signing class. But I think we know, John, that if, if Joel Klatt even did some more digging, what he would find is, oh, this is much more balanced of a class as well, what Brent Venables has done. It is because you look back at you know Lincoln Riley's best class, which was the 2019 group, which brought in Spencer Rattler, you know uh, Jaden Hazelwood, Theo Weese, Trajan Bridges. You look at the top ten prospects that they brought in in that cycle, and I mean, who could you argue that you got significant contributions from? Spencer Rattler, I mean, he helped you win a Big Twelve title. Um, but let's just go down the list. Like Jaden Hazelwood, he was a good player, but off injured, um, never really ascended to what you would hope the you know number one wide receiver in the recruiting class would become uh, Theo Weiss again, a solid player, but again, had the injury in 2021 that, that limited him. But do we think that he ended up becoming the number three wide receiver from that recruiting class? No, uh, we know Trajan Bridges story. I mean, he gone Austin Stogner up and down, not really a ton of opportunities. Jeremiah Cradell, he didn't really rise to the occasion either. Stacy Wilkins, a four-star offensive tackle, had some you know moments for you as a rotational you know player at offensive tackle and then you got Woody Washington who I mean who's played really really good um but again has he been uh, he hasn't ascended to an elite player he's just been a good or a solid player for you uh, and then you get to Joseph Waite who was in the portal and now is back out of the portal and back with Oklahoma you, you hope maybe takes a step and then you're looking at Jaden Davis and Marcus Stripling like it's a bunch of guys that haven't really become like significant big time contributors aside from Spencer Rattler and uh, Woody Washington, like the rest of that. I mean, Jaden Davis has played a lot of snaps for you, but I mean, he's not, he hasn't ascended to be like a, a good starter. I mean, I feel like he's been an average to below average starter for you, but everybody else, you know, Theo Weiss had like his best year was in 2020 when he tied for the team lead in receptions, but was kind of an up and down player himself. So it, you look at, the 2023 class in comparison, and you hope that you get a better return, quote unquote, return on investment uh, from your top 10 players in this, you know, in this cycle that includes Jackson Arnold and Adipoja Adabare and Peyton Bowen, Caden Green, um, Sam Omosigo, Makari Vickers, Derek LeBlanc, Josiah Wagner, Dalen, Sum- uh, Dalen Smothers, um, you know, just a, a lot of really good players. But you hope that they, you know, ascend to that same level, or sorry, they ascend to a, a level that, like, okay, they're we're, we're talking about good to great starters for you. Twenty twenty four season, twenty twenty five season, because I, again, as Clap mentions, they're going to be kind of the fan, foundational piece along with the twenty twenty two class to your transition into the SEC. So you got to hit on those, and and I think that's where we can look back at the recruiting from Lincoln Riley's tenure. And I think that's where they kind of missed a lot is on their evaluations and they just didn't hit on those guys. And, you know, it's still early in the Brent Venables, you know, era of Oklahoma football, but he's got a lot much longer track record of evaluation and of hitting on those prospects than Lincoln Riley has at this point. Um, You know, the quarterbacks have been good. Caleb Williams, Spencer Rattler, they've been good players. Uh, Caleb Williams, obviously he won a Heisman. So you didn't miss on that, but at this point, it's I think the book is still out on his ability to evaluate talent um, aside from the quarterback position. So we'll see how that can kind of continues to you know manifest itself over at USC. But again, Brent Venables has two plus decades 
of talent evaluation and success, especially on the defensive side of the football. Jeff Levy's had a lot of success as well. So I think we feel really good about where they're heading. And I feel pretty, pretty optimistic that this 2023 class and the 2022 guys who I haven't seen much of are going to be big time players for Oklahoma. You know, again, talking about balance, John, the, the first five guys in that 2019 class that kind of got all the flowers, they're all offensive players for Lincoln Riley. And just looking strictly at the early enrollees so far for Oklahoma, top five guys, two offensive players, three defensive players. So, I mean, that's what I'm talking about, right? Where it is, it is much more even and, yeah, we could do a case by case study and what you would find in that 19 class is unfortunately, you know, more of the class than, you know, much more of the class than didn't, didn't pan out. Right. I mean, it just uh, unfortunately played out that way. So hopefully Brent Vittables in Oklahoma has got this class coming in right now where it's going to be yes, 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 yes. Down the board of guys that panned out. The other thing I think that maybe at times we don't talk enough about John is just, you know, with this being the full, full recruiting cycle for Brent Vittables and the staff, man, we've heard so much about name, image, and likeness and the transfer portal and college football's changed so much. Okay, and not here to dispute any of those claims for people that feel that way, but guess what? In this world of all this change and this and that, Brent Vittables just put together the best class you've had in Norman, Oklahoma, basically ever. So, I mean, that's a just generally speaking, surface level, that alone is a terrific sign going forward for OU. Especially as they just kind of start getting their NIL game going. You know, they they had the Norman NIL club going this last, you know, summer and fall. Um, they had the strengthening Oklahoma thing going in the fall, but that's now combined with Crimson and Cream Collective but it's the Crimson and Cream Collective that's really starting to take off and it's really starting to provide opportunities through NIL and who knows what kind of an impact they had on the recruiting class late in the cycle, but Oklahoma is just kind of starting to get started. I think they were kind of slow to the party a little bit just to want to make sure that they were doing everything kind of by the book and not going to run into a Jaden Rashada issue down at Florida, which they had with one of their collectives. And end up in a similar boat where you've you're prom you know somebody is going some rogue agent's going out there and promising money that the collective doesn't have, and then having to you know renege on the agreement because they don't have the finances, and then the school is left kind of in a really bad situation because the collective kind of got out of turn on that front. So I don't I don't think it was a bad thing that Oklahoma kind of got got started slowly on the collective front and are now starting to pick up some steam. We'll see how it all continues to translate. But again, Brent Venables has been adamant that if NIL is the, a priority, then Oklahoma isn't the priority for you. He, he's going to get guys that want to go to Oklahoma. So I think all the things that you said are right. And at the same time, Oklahoma is starting to become, have a little bit better of a footprint on the NIL front. All of this means that it's about time to start turning the page to 2024 and there could be news could be good news for Oklahoma fans in 2024 we'll start sharing some of that with you after we talk to you about LinkedIn jobs linkedin.com backslash locked on college that's where you can go and post your job for free it's uh it's easy you just create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network then you add your job, the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people to hire. They've got simple tools, screening questions that make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate, rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. So check out LinkedIn jobs where it will help you find the candidates that you want to talk to faster. Faster right now today, linkedin.com backslash locked on college, where you can post your job for free. Crystal balls, rivals, future cast. Good news for Oklahoma. There's a wide receiver that uh, we probably need to familiar familiarize ourselves with. Bryant Wesco, the, uh, the latest name out there that 
Oklahoma fans should familiarize themselves with. Why? Well, that's because the Sooners have received a Rivals Future cast from Josh McQuistian of Soonerscoop.com to land West Coast services in the 2024 cycle. John, I'll let you sound off on what you've seen from maybe the tape of Wesco and kind of what your early impressions are. I would just say, uh, just generally speaking, you know, across the board, I'm, I'm looking at your guys' Sooners Wire post right now, which shameless plug right there, everybody. Soonerswire.usatoday.com. Check out John and the crew's great work over there. They've got OU content coming out your way every single day. But basically what I'm gathering is top 215 recruit, uh, some places higher, 24-7 sports, for example, has uh, Wesco all the way as the 102nd player. On three's got him way, way up on the board, 27th nationally, but basically across the board, consensus four-star, consensus 200, uh, you know, 200 player nationally, six foot two, buck 80. So that uh, Jeff Levy type, right? We said from the, really the word go, that Jeff Levy seemed to like, Big frame wide receivers. Well, this would be uh, another of those targets, John. So this is a guy out of the kind of the North Texas area and an area in which we feel like new wide receivers coach Emmett Jones is going to have a huge impact. And we're already starting to see that take place with Bryant Wesco and this, this uh, rivals future cast. He is definitely a promising player. He's one that is going to bring some speed, some size, the ability to win in 50-50 situations, win down the field. Um, he's going to be an outside guy if Oklahoma it does end up landing him. But he's been a player that's kind of on the rise. Uh, he camped with Oklahoma last summer. At the time, he was con just considered a three-star player. So in the course of his junior year, put a lot more productive tape on film. And the, uh, the recruiting analysts took note, and they saw – a four-star player out of him. So he's a player that could continue to rise. Could he could see a PJ Adebare kind of a rise, you know, if he has a great senior season that he could end up or in a great, you know, 7 on 7 season as well, that he could potentially rise into that five-star category. I mean, on threes already got him as what you said, the 27th or uh, 26th best player or wide receiver in the class, 27th best wide receiver, sorry, best player in the class, the sixth best wide receiver in the class, and that could really um that could vault him into five star five star status, you know, if if the rest of the recruiting world starts to follow suit. So, an, an impressive player with size, speed, someone who can win at every level and take the top off the defense, which is an important element in Jeff Levy's offense because so much of it, while yes, so much of it is at or behind the line of scrimmage, a lot of that is to set up the deep shots that you're throwing to the guys like Marvin Mims or now Jaleel Farouk, some other speedsters. You got to have guys that are that can burn a little bit, and Bryant Wesco, he's got that ability. And, you know, Oklahoma's been in on Wesco for a while now. I'm, again, looking at what you guys put out there on Sooners Wire. He, uh, he was at Brent Venables' inaugural Oklahoma football camp. So he was here last summer with Oklahoma. And uh, I I'm just assuming because of the photo that he took that he was offered by Kale Gundy at the time. So Oklahoma's relationship with Bryant Wesco dates all the way back to last summer. So this is not something where Oklahoma offered, you know, last month and all of a sudden now you're, you're getting that future cast. No, Oklahoma has been on the trail here since they, they offered last mid June for Wesco. So great news. It would be, you know, as Oklahoma's, shifting into this 2024 cycle john again we we kind of keep waiting for those first couple of dominoes to fall as uh, we begin the spring and head into the summer you know it was summertime last year where things really really heated up on the recruiting trail for ou so somebody like wesco that again i i, I love that type of size you know six foot two immediately uh, you know that that grabs my attention and, and you're right dallas kid uh i i didn't know uh you probably are more familiar with this town in Texas than I was. Quick Google search tells me it's 25 miles southwest of Dallas. So what you said about Emmett Jones, ding, 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 exactly what we said about Emmett Jones, the Sooners' new wide receivers coach, that the hope was that he's going to be able to clean up in uh, in Texas and specifically the Dallas-Fort Worth Metro. This would be round one if he's able to uh, ultimately win a commitment here. It's just a future cast, but this is at least one good sign out there. Yeah, it is. And I, th I think what's interesting about it is it's coming so quickly in Emmett Jones's tenure. So you know that if Josh McQuistian 
who's not one to put out a future cast unless he's feeling really good about it. If he's putting that out there, you know that the relationship between Wesco and Emmett Jones is, is good. Like that they've already hit it. They've already hit it off. And I think that that's a really good sign. Like Emmett Jones, he's got really good experience as a wide receivers coach, as you know, he was the passing game coordinator for Texas tech too. So that, that's a really intriguing aspect of this because he's a guy that is going to get the wide receivers, the football. Like if he's part of the passing game plan, like, you know, he's getting his guys, the ball. Uh, and, and, and another one that uh, Parker Thune, our, our buddy over there at uh, two, four, seven sports, OU insider, and also the ref, he put in a crystal ball on a 2025 wide receiver prospect also out of the North Texas area in Grayson Harris. Um, this, now this is a little bit more interesting kid because, um, he's more of a slot type receiver, but he's been incredibly productive in just his first two seasons, uh, for Ennis. Uh, he was the district five, five, a, uh, for, he was a first team selection as a sophomore. He was also an offensive newcomer of the year as a freshman. Um, this past season, 87 catches, 1300 yards and 10, 10 touchdowns as just a sophomore. Like that is crazy production. Now, 5'10 is going to be a little bit more smaller in stature, but potentially a guy that's going to be able to win for you on the inside, play a lot of slot wide receiver for you. And obviously the production's already there, which if you're doing that as a sophomore is, is incredible. It really is like that's high level production. And there's a good chance. Again, he's an unrated player right now because we haven't seen many 2025 ratings out there. But this is a guy, if he continues that level of production in the North Texas area, there's a chance, again, that you're looking at a potential five-star down the road once everybody kind of starts getting Grayson Harris on their radar. Well, and he's, as you said, I mean, it's the end of his sophomore year. So let, let's see if 5'11 doesn't turn into 6'1", 6'2", right? I mean, might not be done done uh, growing either. I know that. Yeah, forget people grow after their sophomore year. I stopped. Well, and <laughs> – yours truly as well, but, uh, not the case for everybody. Right. I mean, who knows? Maybe he's, uh, you know, maybe he's not done totally, uh, filling out that frame yet. So, but that's great news. I mean, it sounds like just reading the tea leaves on both of those, John, uh, whether it's McQuistian's future cast or it's Parker's crystal ball right there, you've got multiple prospects that are, you know, one that's really highly regarded one that's probably going to wind up that way that guess what image Jones seems to, have an early leg up on or is very, very much in the uh, the race for. So that was uh, that was probably, I would say, the chief hope with Emmett Jones coming in. I, I told you this uh, when that was announced that, to me, he didn't have this, you know, massive edge of experience just uh, from sheer coaching results. Uh, you know, he did have, obviously, a, a longer collegiate tenure than L. Damian Washington, but it wasn't so pronounced to where you just say, oh, absolutely – uh, you know, Emmett Jones is just light years in front of LaDamian Washington. But the one thing that he did seemingly have is more relationships in the Dallas, Dallas Fort Worth Metro. So that's clearly going to work already. Yeah. And it's going to continue to be working in Oklahoma's favor. Uh, and this is no you know shot at LD, you know, Washington. It's just when you have the connections that he has and the blue blood cachet that Oklahoma has, and we're talking about Emmett Jones combined with Oklahoma, that's going to yield some really positive results. I mean, Emmett Jones was part of the recruitment that got Eric Ezekonma to Texas Tech. If he's able to get a player like that to Texas Tech, what's he going to be able to do with Oklahoma, its history, its background, its potential, its coaching staff, its facilities, everything that goes into playing football at the University of Oklahoma with his recruiting prowess, like that's going to be huge for Oklahoma. And it's going to be huge for Jeff Levy and his offense, Jackson Arnold, and hopefully a Michael Hawkins down the road as well. What is up with basketball, Josh? My goodness. I, I, I don't even know what to say, but we'll have some thoughts on it. Uh, after I talk to y'all about built bar, built bar is the best tasting protein bar ever. Maybe Oklahoma's men's basketball needs some built bar in their locker room before the game. Cause they need a boost, uh, low calorie, low sugar, high protein, Bars range from 170 to 180 calories and 17 to 18 grams of protein. They taste great, great flavors. Mint brownie, peanut butter brownie are two of my favorites, but they've also got you know chocolate, uh, sorry, double chocolate, coconut almond, coconut brownie chunk, which is also really, really good as well. And then several, uh, what, what they call built puffs that are kind of marshmallowy texture. If you're a big fan of like a moon pie or a s'more, 
you want to check out the Built Puffs. They're fantastic. They taste great and they're great for you. Great, you know, meal replacement, great pre-workout, post-workout. My, my kids love them. It's a great snack for them too. It's a little bit on the healthier side than having just a piece of candy or a cookie or something like that. So go check out built.com. Use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your next order over at built.com. And Josh, so Oklahoma Sooners basketball, we thought that Bedlam was kind of the rough moment. Uh, first, I think we probably thought the, the win over Alabama was going to be a turning point for the Oklahoma Sooners. And now it looks like it's just going to be the high point of a season that is really trending in a pretty, pretty poor position at this point. I'm going to, as we talk through this thing here, I'm going to pull up last season's schedule and figure this out kind of, kind of on the go, but uh, Oklahoma. Yes. You thought that Alabama game was, was going to be the turning point perhaps for this season. Now, Granted, you you knew even that day leaving the Lloyd Noble Center, okay, Oklahoma's not going to shoot the way that they shot versus Alabama, but okay, confidence boost, massive springboard coming down the home stretch, back-to-back winnable games before, uh, again, a daunting, daunting close to the schedule. <laughs> now that Oklahoma State and West Virginia are in the rear view, the schedule looks like this, John. At Baylor versus Kansas versus Kansas State at Texas. Texas Tech game at home at Iowa State, at Kansas State versus TCU. So that's what's remaining, okay? And coming out of that Alabama game, you said to yourself, okay, they they shot the lights out, not going to shoot like that again, but has this team feeling better about itself going into, again, games that should be gettable? Bedlam at home where just that, you know, first time you played, second half, don't know what happened there, went horribly wrong. At West Virginia, already beat those guys once. Didn't score a field goal in the final however many minutes, but found a way to just just sneak out that first win, right? So on the heels of that Alabama game, you're thinking, okay, chance to really position themselves to just need a couple coming down the home stretch to to get themselves right there in the thick of the NCAA tournament race. And simply put, John, they've fallen flat on their face in in both games. The Oklahoma State game wasn't as close as 71-61 to would indicate. The West Virginia game, 93-61 93 to 61 might not do justice to how lopsided that game was. So uh, it was a nightmarish game. Tanner Groves got into all sorts of foul trouble. I think he only played 11 minutes in the game, right? And, and fouled out. So just a disaster. And, you know, I guess we address it. Do we address it right now? There's people out there that are kind of tossing the idea around. Is this the beginning of the end or is the, the hourglass running out of sand on Porter Moser? Is the clock ticking? I still feel like, give him one more chance to this uh, this offseason retool things and try and get the roster where he wants it. But the bottom line is the bottom line. And, you know, 12 and 11 and 2 and 8 in Big 12 play, that's just not going to cut it for people. No, I think there were much higher expectations for this year. And, yes, the Big 12 basketball conference is the best in the country. Yes, you're you're going up against some of the best players in the nation every single week. But you can't get beat by 32 you just can't and then not and then not avoid the hot seat. I'm you know Porter Mosier, he's a good dude. He's brought a lot of energy to the program. He's, you know, working on trying to build it up. But it 9361 is not okay. And, you know, losing both games to, you know, to Oklahoma State and Bedlam. Do they have I think, you know, they got personnel problems relative to what Porter Mosier wants to do offensively. You know, they don't have the shooters to run Porter Moser's offense, in my opinion, he, he generate his offense generates a lot of open looks, but they don't have consistent enough shooters, especially from three to be able to take advantage of those. Um, they don't have any size inside. I mean, they got Tanner Groves inside, but I should say this, they don't have any athleticism inside. He is not an athletic player and he's been exposed, uh, the last couple of weeks or last couple of games in particular, and it's not going to get any easier, you know, with the, the games that they have remaining, they got seven of eight teams that they're playing in the final eight are ranked in the top 15 in the country. So the big 12 being either a blessing or a curse, you could go and have, you know, if you split those games, maybe you kind of put yourself back on the positive side of the bubble, but you have a really good, there's a really good chance you could lose out the rest of the season if you're not able to turn some things around, I mean, and if you do that, I don't even know if you can 
consider bringing him back for a third season unless you just hope that the recruits that he has coming in next year are going to be that much of a, a difference or make that much of a difference in the 2023, 2024 season. Cause as it stands now, I mean, we're not, I don't think we're seeing enough out of Bajan Cortez to feel great about Oklahoma's future. I mean, I think we like Owe. I think we like um, what we're seeing in Miles Uzan. Um, but just the collective just doesn't seem to be fitting right now. And who knows if, this team has been affected by some of the Porter Mosier rumors to Notre Dame, but they're not playing good ball. And there's a, there's a lot of reasons for it, but ultimately it falls on your coach. And for whatever reason, this team can't start on a good note and they can't shoot well. And on nights when they don't shoot well, they're trying to jack up, jack up a bunch of threes when they don't shoot it consistently enough to do that. I know I've kind of harped on that front for much of the last few weeks, but it keeps coming back to that. There's no reason they should be shooting 23s in a game because they don't shoot it consistently enough to shoot 23s in a game. So agreed with that. I mean, obviously just as simple as you can put it, whether it's the interior, Sherfield's a nice player on the outside personnel, top to bottom. They're just, they're not as good as teams in this league. And I do think that, you know, not having a couple of athletic bigs like Oklahoma sees on a regular basis in the Big 12, I mean, I think that's that's really hampering Sherfield's ability to night in and night out go be a consistent guy. Like, not who he was versus Alabama, John, but within shouting distance of that player, right? There's so much put on his plate to have to be who he was versus Alabama because there's just not a ton of help around him. Jalen Hill, really nice player. I I love what he adds defensively. I love that he can guard multiple positions, but John offensively it's, it's, is he going to show up? Is he not going to show up? He's not consistent in that regard for Oklahoma. He's just never developed that way for OU. And that you're talking about, that's probably your second best player is somebody that hasn't necessarily developed offensively. You probably going to have some problems when that's the case. 31 and 27 right now is where Porter Moser is at uh, in terms of wins and losses in his Oklahoma tenure. And the thing that I was curious to look at, John, was this. Remember last year, Oklahoma started 12 and 3, and there was some legitimate excitement. They had that big win over Arkansas out in Tulsa, a, a good Arkansas team where Oklahoma embarrassed them. And then guess what happened? They won two games out of 13. They went 2 and 11 in that stretch. Just a dreadful stretch for Oklahoma right now. Not that it was anywhere close to 12 and three started 10 and five that Texas tech win stabilized themselves a little bit in big 12 play, but they're two and five cents, John. And Oh, by the way, we already, we already touched on what the schedule looks like going forward. I got news for you. If you're trying to be optimistic, this isn't getting better over these next couple of games for Oklahoma. This is going to, it's going to resemble what you saw last year in that two and 11 stretch. It's, it's going to be right in that ballpark. So man, I, you know, I, I think that he's getting a third year, but uh, obviously, you know, the, 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 I, and I love Porter Moser. I want it to work. I think that it can work, but uh, there's gotta be some soul searching done over there and they got to find a way. I don't know how you do it. If it's transfer portal, whatever it is, if there's some sort of late signing you can find, they have to find bigs. That could be difference makers, John. Hopefully a couple of these guys that are bringing in in this signing class can join Otega Owe and Milos Yuzan and be difference makers too. But yeah, the uh, you know, from where I'm sitting, unfortunately, yes, year three is probably – you're going to be coaching for your job if you're Porter Moser. Yeah, and you know, Joe C., Joe Castiglione, he's a patient dude. He's going to give him opportunities. At what point, though, do you kind of see the writing on the wall? And we'll see. I mean, I think I think you're right. 2023, 2024 will be that legit hot seat season for him. And I mean, he's a good coach. He's shown it, you know, at his previous spot at Loyola Chicago. And again, if the Notre Dame rumors are true, maybe he's not even here for 2023, 2024. He could be off the, to coach the Fighting Irish. We'll see. Uh, but that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Thank you so much for joining the show. Again, don't forget about the live show on Monday night, 9 p.m. Central Time with myself and Josh. We'll 
get into all sorts of Oklahoma things. Might even touch on some softball as well. But until then, make sure you follow the show on Twitter at Locked On Sooner. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. We're free and avail- available on all platforms. Follow Josh on Twitter at Josh on Ref. Myself at John Nine Williams. But until Monday night, where we go live with you for Locked On Sooners Live. Talk to you then.